Good morning, Jags. This is Fahad. Today is Wednesday, November 4th. Let's get started. The chart that you're looking at in front of you is Russell 2000 index overnight chart. The gray area is the overnight session trading, and the black area over here was the trading that happened in the regular market ses session yesterday. I'll come back to this chart in a little bit, but let me just explain from 10 minutes ago when I pulled the data what's appearing on my screen. Now, as we know, elections is on everyone's mind right now with votes being counted at this moment. Here is the actual chart from predicted as when I pulled it about 15 minutes ago, perhaps. And now Biden is on the lead with the highest in, uh, the highest chance of winning. In fact, I just saw, like I said, this chart is about from 15 minutes ago, but about five minutes ago, I got I saw another message that popped in my screen that Biden's odds are now actually well above 80 percent right now, while Trump odds are dropping close to 20 percent of who, of winning the election. Why is this important? Here's what's what's actually coming down to. This is the actual chart of the Electoral College right now. And now there are only three states remaining where the count is still taking place. That's Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. Um, most important thing about this is that Biden is at 254 right now, and Michigan has 16 electoral vote. If he wins Michigan, Biden will win the presidency. For Trump, he has to win all three. For Biden, he has to win only one of the three. But I wanna focus on my state. I wanna focus on Michigan, which is 16 electoral votes. Will he win this? Because here's something interesting that is taking place. This is the actual chart of the total voting patterns um, uh, or tracking the vote in the state of Michigan since the polling, uh, polling station closed uh, at 7.15 or 7.30, whatever time it was last night. The lead continues to narrow, and so far 86% re have reported. But here's interesting. When I drilled further down into this, we find out that Wayne County, and I live in Wayne County. This is the Detroit area, although I don't live in Detroit. I live way outside of Detroit. I'm closer to Ann Arbor than I am to Detroit. But Wayne County is the most populated county in the state of Michigan. And that county has so far reported only 54% of the total votes. Nearly 800,000 votes have yet to come in. And all of those votes happen to be basically the mail-in ballots. And if you look at the makeup of this mail-in ballot votes that are coming in, they are overwhelmingly going for Biden, somewhere between 75 to 80 percent right now. When you blend it together with the actual election day ballot, it puts Biden at 72 percent. So about half of the votes of, from the largest county in Michigan, Wayne County that is, it has a still to come in. And the, what does this mean? If that chart, if the if the if the actual continues, if the if these voting patterns continue, and the decision for this will likely be settled within the next couple of hours during the market hours. All right. So if Biden flips um, uh, Michigan in his favor, at that point the presidency is decided. It doesn't even matter then what happens to Georgia. It doesn't even matter what happens to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. It never occurred to me. Um, coming in this morning before today, that ultimately the decision point will come down to one single county, which is Wayne County in Michigan. And that's where I live. But that's where we are right now. Now, with all of this said, let's focus on in exactly the market. If in the next couple of hours, Wayne County votes continue to come out in Michigan, and we find out that Biden maintains the lead, which gives him Michigan, Within the next couple of hours, it could happen by lunchtime today. I expect Russell 2000 index to break out sharply. If you look at this chart in the overnight session, when this Russell 2000 index was selling off sharply, that was precisely the moment, moment when Trump was surging in polls. When Russell 2000 index was surging, that's when Trump was falling in polls. And then, similarly, when Russell 2000 index came down, once again, Trump was surging. There is a near, I want to say, 95% inverse correlation between uh, Trump odds of winning the election and the Russell 2000 index. And so right now, Russell 2000 index is basically only slightly down by 0.6% compared to where it closed yesterday. But if you look at it on a daily scale, 
this is where it gets very interesting. I showed this chart multiple times, including in webinar yesterday as well. If Wayne County vote, which could potentially be settled by lunchtime today, if it is settled and if it's in favor of Biden, I would expect uh, uh, Russell 2000 index to break out through this 1650 level. If you go to IWM chart, it equates to this level, it equates to 163.80. If IWM takes out 163.80, I believe that this thing will power higher all the way to new 52 week high, probably rising to 170 to 172 level. So watch the weekly call options in IWM. I, uh, and, and the good thing is that the volatility, which was extremely elevated um, going into the elections, will get crushed. So the premiums in these upside call options will collapse right at the market open, potentially providing a cheaper, lower cost entry, whichever the strike basically you choose to trade with. Right now, when I'm looking at VIX, and I covered this also yesterday in webinar, VIX is getting absolutely destroyed. And this is exactly what was expected. VIX closed at about 36 yesterday. It's at, it's at near 31 right now. And as the day progresses, I expect this VIX to continue to come down all the way to uh, 27 to 26 level. And as a result, those expensive premiums in these short-term call options, because the event risk is over in both IWM and, and SPY, they will collapse. And at that point, if IWM starts to break out through this key resistance, right, all comes down to this Wayne County tally from Michigan, which could be settled in the next couple of hours, expect IWM to break out and make a run towards 170. I don't know if it will make that run today, could be tomorrow, could be in the next couple of days, but it depends on this election outcome from the state of Michigan, which is my state. Anyway, so that's the big level view that I wanted to provide. I also want to quickly cover Uber, the significance of this, as we saw um, and, and as I covered in, um, uh, in Telegram last night, as well as this morning, Uber is going to have a massive breakout in uh, today. So the stock closed at $35.77 yesterday. And if you look at the pre-market session, it's trading above $40 per share. So on a percentage basis, this is about now 14 to 15% move higher. And if you go back to the... Uh, if you go back to the long-term scale, you will see what this means. This means that it is clearing all of this congestion level, all of this congestion level going all the way back to the entire year. When I look at the long-term weekly scale, the significance of this breakout in Uber is this should actually, even though the momentum to the upside will gradually slow down, but the chances are given this major risk that was in place with Prop 22 vote in California now behind us, the multiple expansion should continue and the stock should continue to go higher in my view, all the way to post IPO high, which means in the high 40s, above $47 per share. Also, Bank of America is already out with a note this morning talking about that um, this will also allow both Uber and Lyft to now slowly start to increase the prices, the ride sharing prices, um, as was expected previously, which will be positive for their top line revenues as well as gross margins. So a fantastic breakout. Reminder to everybody. On October 8, right over here, we recommended buying Uber January 4050 call spread for $2.50 or less. I am still holding that call spread. All the Jack clients are still holding that call spread. And back then, too, I presented this technical bullish view and I said I'm looking for a breakout through $38 resistance and the long term weekly scale also looking for a breakout. Well, we're finally getting that breakout. So I'll be banking profits on this after market opens today. And that's it from me, Jay. Good morning, Fahd. Uh, so today <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a recent IPO um, and I'll have a homepage article on this one uh, most likely later today. Uh, that IPO, which debuted about a month ago, uh, is Pulmonix. Uh, symbol is L-U-N-G, Lung. Uh, priced at 19, had an opening print of $40 per share and now trading at 47. Uh, this is a med tech company that provides a minimally invasive treatment for severe emphysema patients. 
Uh, more specifically, its uh, treatment and solution is comprised of the Zephyr endobronchial valve, uh, which is already FDA approved. Uh, it was approved back in June of 2018. Uh, looking at the total market opportunity, uh, in the U.S., there are roughly 3.8 million patients diagnosed with emphysema, with roughly 40% or 1.5 million patients having severe emphysema. And based on Zephyr's current FDA indication, there are approximately 500,000 eligible, patient, eligible patients in the U.S. And then outside the U.S., there are an additional 700,000 eligible patients. Uh, so overall, the global patient pool represents a total market opportunity of roughly 12 billion. Uh, and earlier this week, uh, the company announced a positive Zephyr valve reimbursement decision from Healthcare Service Corporation, or HCSC, uh, and they are a Blue Cross Blue Shield organization member. Uh, Steve was out with a note shortly after that, um, just highlighting that Blue Cross Blue Shield still remains a very large U.S. commercial insurer yet to issue a positive, uh, positive coverage. Um, however, as the second largest member under Blue Cross, uh, this HCSC coverage decision is obviously encouraging um, and obviously sets them up for potential future decisions. Um, but like I said, I'll have a more detailed homepage article later today. Uh, very interesting company, and I love the symbol actually, LUNG, yeah. L-U-N-G. So it's a perfect symbol to basically uh, identify itself by with what the company actually provides. Um, should be an interesting read for me. I'm always interested in all kinds of um, uh, up and coming med tech. And, and I'm looking at, as you were talking, uh, for the nine months ended September, actually, no, hold on a second. I have the wrong, um, wrong one open over here. But I was, hold on a second. Nope. I'm coming up with the wrong data, so I have to pull something else. But one thing what I would like to see, Jay, as you prepare this mm -hmm. homepage article, is to see if if there is a trend that we can identify in the top line revenue growth or expected top line revenue growth. Basically, I'm sure the S1 filings are out there. Yeah. I haven't had a chance, but I would love to see exactly what the last six months were and what they were compared to prior year. Um, it would be an interesting read on the top line revenue with $1.6 billion in market capitalization, if I'm not mistaken, should be an interesting one to see how it provides over time and a very powerful candle yesterday as well. So technicals look pretty good. Definitely. All right. Good stuff. Chronicle. Good morning. A uh, quick update for Jaguar Media. I have a couple things lined up over the next several weeks. I'll preview the first item today and then tomorrow I'll preview that other project. So the, the first upcoming video and write-up I'm working on is going to be a standalone thematic trade idea. So it's not going to be Chinese tech demystified and it's not going to be Jaguar investing. It's a standalone idea like what we did with BHP, UPS, uh, Banco de Chile, Rexford, and so on. So with these thematic ideas, what I always try to do is to look for under the radar themes that are either currently taking place or are going to take place in the future. So if I were to describe my own trading style, I'm, I'm always looking about six to 12 months ahead and asking myself, what are some things that I'm seeing that consensus is not seeing right now? And, and then I go from there. For example, if we rem remember Fahad with UPS back when I wrote the note and we released the video on May 21st, very few on Wall Street were talking about how transportation and industrials macro data were quietly outperforming services. And so my thinking back then was that consensus was way too bearish on UPS at the time and bearish on industrials in general. If we were to just go by price action, UPS stock was looking technically very weak. So this was a very contrarian call by us back then. And then other examples of hidden themes, if we remember Banco de Chile, um, you know, very few are paying attention to all the problems that are taking place in Chile right now. It's only when things start to escalate, like, for example, if a leftist candidate wins next year's election as a result of protests and all these, um, all the pensions crisis, and then Chilean stocks start to crash, that's when it finally gets attention. Um, and then there's Rexford, where the hidden theme is scarcity in the SoCal infill regions. There's also uh, BHP where the theme is slowing rural residential construction in China. 
this one hasn't worked out, but it's an under the radar theme nonetheless. Um, so we're, we're thinking of packaging all of this into a series called Jaguar Theme Trades. Uh, but coming back to the preview itself, I won't reveal the company yet, but I'll touch on the hidden themes that I'm bringing forward for this trade, basically the premise for this trade idea. So the first theme is that general downstream activity and chemicals prices in China have been improving and outperforming Brent, while at the same time, supply demand dynamics globally have been sharply improving. But um, the hidden component here is that with low oil prices, the Asian NAFTA chemical players have a massive advantage over their American players when it comes to margins and profitability. Um, Fahad, I'm not seeing a lot of people talk about this advantage that the Asian players have. And this is not something we can uncover just by looking at headline PPI, because the negative PPIs that we're seeing all over Asia is due to the weakness in oil, not chemicals. So that's the first hidden theme for this upcoming idea. Now, don't laugh, Fahad, but the other theme that I, I think is going ignored is buy China, build China. What do <laughs> I mean by this? So at Jaguar Analytics, we've been banging the table on buy America, build America. And when I look at analyst notes talking about infrastructure, and also when I look at price action of these construction stocks, this is slowly becoming consensus trade. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but in terms of uncovering the next big trade and opportunity, now is the time to start looking for the next theme that consensus is not paying attention to. And I think what's going under the radar right now is buy China, build China, which is the other hidden half of the buy America, build America story. Because this theme of America trying to build itself and become slightly more self-reliant has also indirectly res resulted in China wanting to build and rely on itself. There's a cause and effect here because we cannot have buy America, build America without giving rise to buy China, build China. So if you've been following our first read over the last week, you'll know that China has just wrapped up its central committee plenum. And if we were to look at the communique from that event, it's very clear from that release that China's leaders are prioritizing self-reliance but the thing is, I'm not seeing much coverage regarding this on Wall Street. It's been almost crickets, um, which leads me to believe that everybody is focusing on the American side of the story. But for the most part, they're ignoring the other half, which is buy China, build China. This is going under the radar. And so I'm, I'm working on a long idea right now on a company I think will benefit tremendously from the upcoming boost in Chinese manufacturing as a result of the country's aim to become more self-reliant on top of bullish chemical and NAFTA fundamentals. So I'll leave it at that. And then tomorrow I'm going to preview the project, the other project I'm working on, which is going to be a three to four part mini series. All right, sounds interesting. Um, looking forward to exactly what the idea is. I'm assuming it's going to be naturally Asian focused and it's going to be in the manufacturing space. And um, as far as the manufacturing space, uh, that's the area that we like a lot. We've been talking about that nonstop. Pretty much everything in machinery and the manufacturing space, uh, we have been endorsing the bull case for that for several months now, really since the beginning of September. So uh, this will also fit in nicely with that theme overall. I guess maybe we could start calling it, you know, uh, buy the globe, build a globe, <laughs> or uh, or whatever you want to call it. But looking forward to exactly what you come up with. Should be a very interesting one as usual. And then let me know when it's ready. We'll move forward with the Jaguar Media presentation. All right, sounds good. Um, all right, folks, we're going to stop over here. Most important thing is that I'm hoping that we can turn this, to, we can close this chapter on the elections today. So watch how the Russell 2000 index. Uh, reacts as the day goes by. And as I said, I'm looking for a technical breakout in IWM through 163.80. That's it from me. I'll see you in the chat room shortly.